flipped. A professional development program for higher degree supervisors and students. Welcome to this flipped training session on how to write a teaching philosophy. Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. We're focused today on asking you to think about yourself as a learner, as a teacher, as a trainer, and how you convey this information to others. I've argued quite staunchly that university academics should also hold teaching qualifications. So yes, you have a degree in biology, Yes, you have a degree in history, but you also hold a teaching qualification so you can actually do the job. I lost that debate 10 years or so ago, can I say? But the PhD is obviously great and it's an important degree, but there's nothing in the PhD that gives you the information or the knowledge you require for teaching and learning in undergraduate or graduate education. You have a PhD. And that's not a PhD in how to teach in higher education. You have no sense through a PhD program about how to configure curriculum, how to configure learning outcomes, how to select educational technology, how to manage multimodality in what you do in teaching and learning, and also how to manage on and off campus subjects, how you manage the course and the differences between online and offline offerings. So what's often argued in higher education is that experience is all you need. So you learn on the job. You learn to be a teacher in higher education by teaching in higher education. And you have to decide if that's good enough for you. And that's good enough for our students. And that's good enough for our nation. That learning on the job is enough for the highest modes of teaching that we do in our sector in our universities. Now, as most of you know, I hold three bachelor degrees, four master's degrees, a couple of graduate diplomas, and a PhD. And trust me, I did not intend in my life to have that suite of qualifications. It sort of happened accidentally. And certainly I have my traditional bachelor degree and my traditional disciplines with my traditional master's degree, and all of that's great. But then I realised very early on that the future of knowledge is interdisciplinary. So I did an interdisciplinary bachelor degree and an interdisciplinary master degree, master's degree. And then, of course, I did an interdisciplinary PhD. But all that's fine. But this is where the story perhaps becomes a bit more interesting. And I want you to think about this in your own life. After my PhD, I then returned and did another couple of degrees in education, particularly a Bachelor of Education and a Master's of Education, because I believe that teaching and learning in higher education requires expertise, it requires knowledge, rather than simply experience through doing it. What if it's a bad experience? So I'd just like you to think about your relationship with teaching and learning. And therefore, a key question really is, what is this teaching philosophy and why do employers ask for it now? The income that is earned in our universities comes from teaching. Teaching subsidises research rather than the other way around. So the people who employ you want to know that if you're coming to work at an institution, you know what you're doing in the teaching space. So passion and commitment are great, but can you actually teach? Yes, you have to have a PhD. And that affirms that you've got knowledge and expertise in a discipline. And that's great. So the PhD is incredibly important. But your future employers need to see that you can teach. And one of the proxies to see if you can teach is a teaching philosophy. There's also, of course, a bigger reason beyond employability that you think about a teaching philosophy, because a good teacher is a reflexive teacher. A good teacher thinks about what they're doing and every single day realises that actually we're not teachers, we're all learners. And every morning we wake up and we should make a decision to learn something new. And so enters the teaching philosophy. In this flipped session, I'm providing the scaffolding questions so that you can write one today. So let's get into it. The really easy questions that form a teaching philosophy. So a teaching philosophy is a document that is between one and two pages in length. 
and it addresses really three separate areas. Firstly, your conceptualization of teaching and learning. Secondly, a description of how you teach. And finally, a rationale for why you teach. So that you can see the three questions move to the what, the how, and the why. That's the teaching philosophy. So this short document can stand alone in a lot of job applications. And a lot of job applications, particularly in North America at the moment, ask for a teaching philosophy. You can also put it at the end of an application. But the teaching philosophy can also, and frequently is, the first two pages of a much bigger document that's called a teaching portfolio that you develop through your career. A teaching portfolio features all sorts of documents like student evaluations, the curricula that you've designed, particular educational technologies that you've developed like podcasts, podcasts that you've created that you can link to in the teaching portfolio. Noting how often teaching philosophies are used in job applications, it's a really good idea (laughs) to have a draft of a teaching philosophy just sitting on your hard drive in some form. It is a living document. You write one when you're doing your PhD and then you start your teaching career. And I still have one to this day and I look at it about once a month and make some changes. So this is a living, breathing document. This is the you and your perspective on the world that you want other people to see and understand. It is a narrative where you describe and you define, you discuss who you are as a teacher and what's important to you. At its best, and this might be the next iteration of the teaching philosophy, at its best, it can provide the standards and the criteria by which you configure what is high quality teaching. And then, of course, through your career, you can assess yourself through that criteria. As I talked about, in North America, this is a major area. And actually, the teaching philosophy is splintered into a whole series of different documents. So, Engage with the teaching philosophy, but know that if you're working in the North American system, you may be asked for a series of other documents. So, a philosophy of education, a philosophy of classroom management, a philosophy of educational technology, and of course, something I ask all our PhD supervisors at CDU to do, I ask for a higher degree supervisory philosophy. When you think about your teaching philosophy, you're going to think about your current abilities. What do you believe you do well and the areas in which you believe you can improve? Now, Steve Brockfield was an incredibly influential scholar and, you know, uh, it was a long time ago. I read him first in my early 20s when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And this was before I'd done the teaching qualifications, but I was teaching. And so I was trying to work out who I was as a teacher. And he defined a teaching philosophy as, quote, an organizing vision, end of quote. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, an organizing vision. What are you trying to achieve through your teaching and your learning? And how do you activate your personal and professional expertise in and through the classroom? So let's talk about how we do one now. So I want to get you organized so you can actually have a first go at writing a teaching philosophy. Now, internationally, there is no template There's no limitation on the length of pages, but you'll never really see one much longer than two pages, so try to keep it to that. It's also personal. It's written in the first person. So what I'm going to do for you now is ask some enabling questions that I'd like you to write down, and your answer to those questions might only be a paragraph, and that will be the start of your teaching philosophy. Once you've answered my questions, then remove the questions. They're just the scaffold to get you into thinking about your teaching. So the scaffolding questions are just for you. Answer them and then remove the headings. Right, here are the headings. Why is teaching important to you? How do people learn? How do you develop a student's potential? What is an outstanding teaching moment for you. 
describe for me how you improve as a teacher. What are the aspirations you hold for yourself during your career? Now, those questions will get you to some first version of a teaching philosophy. But also remember that the people who are reading it haven't seen you teach yet. So you need to configure a word picture for them so that they actually can see the sort of teacher that you are. Show how you put your beliefs in practice through your teaching and your learning. Now, we've asked the easy questions, and that will do. That's your first draft. But I also want to put out some provocations for you to really get you thinking about who you are as a teacher. You know, basically, I'm trying to get you to think about what matters to you and what doesn't matter to you. So let's go for this bit. You tell me, are teachers or are students responsible for learning? Is teaching a political act? Is teaching activism or should politics be kept out of the classroom? How do we as teachers improve what we do? And finally, how do you manage the students who struggle? Have you got a theory of differentiated learning? So as you can see, this next set of questions start to get pretty specific about what is important to you, not simply what you're interested in, but part of your role and function as you see it for the next generation. Basically, this mode of a teaching philosophy asks why you're in the business of teaching and learning. Is it to enable citizenship, to enable teamwork, to enable collaboration? Are you interested in employability? Are you interested in critical thinking? And remember, this can be and, and, and. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Teaching philosophies change through our career, and that's okay. When we start teaching, so often we focus on the content, making sure the content is right. So we get really engaged with the content in the curriculum, the information, the knowledge base. But through our career, we start to move to assessment and to understanding why people learn, then quality and mode of feedback interactions with students, interactions with colleagues. So from this basis, from this first two-pager that you're going to write, all sorts of ideas and aspirations spin out about your wider teaching and learning life. So start collecting material for your teaching portfolio. It might be student evaluations, curricular documents, and it is really important to hold on to as well those unsolicited student comments about you and your teaching. Keep every single email. They'll be useful to help you get a job and also, of course, very useful for promotion. The brilliant Brian Coppola once stated that a teaching and learning philosophy should answer one question. One question. What is teaching and learning for you? What is teaching and learning for you? If you can answer that question in life, <laughs> let alone in a teaching philosophy, you're doing incredibly well. So remember, this teaching philosophy will develop through your career. Be really comfortable with this and with this development and know that this first go is where you simply express who you are as a teacher and a learner in the world. And I look forward to our conversations in our seminar. Thank you for your time. <music>